do is I'm going to amplify a bit on the social economic uh, side of things uh, in terms of the fiscal uh, compact. Uh, I'm then going to critique it uh, uh, and it's billed here as a critical political economy analysis and it certainly is. But my critique actually is uh, has a lot in common with what you would read in the Financial Times and the Economist. There's a really, really interesting convergence mm -hmm. of uh, 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 economic journalists and analysts coming from the sort of Anglo-Saxon financial side and what critical political economists are saying. And, uh, and so, you know, in that, in that regard, this shouldn't be pigeonholed, it's just uh, another uh, loony lefty. Uh, saying this. And I think that's actually quite an interesting convergence. But then I want to move beyond that. I mean, and uh, I sort of put all this, put the fiscal contract in context. Why I, if the financial press is saying that this is mad, why, why is it happening? And I think that there is a real material concrete context to why this is happening. And I'm going to talk about that in two levels. I'm going to talk about it at the conjunctural level. I think we have had a very, very strange conjuncture since 2009 in the European economy. And I'm going to talk about that, and I'm going to suggest that it's unsustainable. And I'm also then going to talk about it in a structural context, which is the, what, what Heike talked about, the exhaustions of finance-led accumulation, and talk about the relationship between Europe and America in the global economy, and also suggest that the foundation upon which the European economic policy concept has been based on over the last uh, 10, 15, and even beyond is also crumbling. And, and therefore, uh, not only is this a problem of democracy, it is that too, and I, I'd like to hopefully say a few things about that when, we, when we, we get to the discussion, but I also think that we are, this is a policy concept that is resting on increasingly crumbling foundations. Um, okay, let me first start by outlining some of the elements of the, of the fiscal compact, or the latest version, as I saw, from January, January 31st, was Treaty on Stability, Coordination and Governance in the Economic and Monetary Union. It may very well have changed. Uh, uh, let's remind ourselves, this is the successor of the 1996 Broken Stability Pact, it failed, uh, because it was uh, broken by Germany and France in November 2003, when too slow growth uh, meant that they broke the 3% deficit threshold. That's actually think for reasonable uh, uh, reasons. Uh, now, they want to go back to this, uh, but they're going to make the structural deficit side even tighter. Uh, the structural deficits must not, must not exceed 0.5% of GDP. So they, sort of the, the, the fiscal rigor is, is becoming even, even tighter. There is even more tight fiscal austerity. Which can only be broken in deep recessions or exceptional circumstances, which uh, are not up to the definition of the member states. This has to be agreed by, uh, by the uh, trias politica in, in the EU. If you break the 0.5 rule, and at the moment, everyone except Finland and Estonia uh, are, have broken the rule. Germany, the Netherlands are beyond 0.5%. You activate something called the excessive deficit procedure, uh, which means in the rather Orwellesque language, you enter into economic partnership programs uh, with the European Commission, the European Central Bank, where NATO is involved, and the European Council. And you have to make detailed prescriptions on structural as well as budgetary reform that will need to be agreed by all these, and which then will be defined in EU law. And uh, if you then break this deal, uh, they, you can be taken to court by the European Council uh, Commissioner or, or another member state. And uh, if you have contravened on this uh, economic partnership uh, contract that you signed, uh, I, uh, the European Court can uh, assign a penalty up to 0.1% of the GDP to be paid into the European Stability Mechanism Fund. Uh, uh, I suppose it is in this context one, one can have the discussion about democracy and, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, now, of course, this is sort of the conditionality side. Uh, that has been put on the European Stability Mechanism Special Purpose Vehicle, which in, together with the IMF commitment is uh, a 750 billion firewall 
to uh, I try to maintain the credibility of the of the euro by supporting countries that have gotten into into trouble. In order to sort of sign up to this, I, the sort of fiscal compact comes on that on the insistence, for example, of of the of the Mercosur the Mercosur <coughs> axis. Uh, it is also the backdrop to the European Central Bank 489 billion liquidity injection in December. Mario Draghi, when he saw that this was coming uh, on December 9th, said, okay, that's good enough for me, I'm gonna inject money into it. Now, let's remember that the stability mechanism and this injection was made at the brink of absolute economic collapse. Uh, it was very clear in December that the European interbank markets were drying up, and they had to do this in order to just maintain the European economy with real dangers of containing into, into the world economy and bring us back to where we were in 2028. But it is the conditionality of this. So, by way of critique of the fiscal compact, I, I, I and people like me, but also if you read the Financial Times like Martin Wolf, I would I suggest that this is a symptomatic of what used to be said about the last Bourbon king of France, that they had forgotten nothing and he'd learned nothing. <coughs> and this is a kind of a sense of that we are just repeating the same mistakes again and the stakes keep on getting higher. And to sort of put this in a nutshell, I think that the, uh, the, the question that is raised about from where is final aggregate demand going to come from? Where, where is the, cons if we, are, if we are tightening the European economy like this, who, when wages, social benefits, etc., government spending all goes down, who is going to buy the products? <coughs> who is, uh, who is, and particularly in a situation that Greece, Spain, etc., find themselves, when they cannot, like Finland and Sweden did in 1992, in our Nordic banking crisis, instigated a massive devaluation. Uh, as a sort of immediate, you can't do that in the, so the fiscal stimulus has to come from somewhere else. The problem is, is very concrete. Uh, they, since the inception of the euro, the so-called pigs have lost 20% of relative unit labor costs vis-a-vis -vis Germany. And you have a massive balance of payment surplus in Germany, Finland is also part of it, Sweden, Netherlands, and so on. And you have a deficit in uh, in the so-called pigs, uh, which is represented by this 20% relative unit labor cost. The Eurozone as a whole is basically in balance with the rest of the world. How is that going to be that cost disadvantage be recaptured at a time when Germany is running less than 1% rate of inflation, unless it becomes self-defeating and deflationary? That is that you have to uh, go into such a strong measure of austerity that the growth rates become negative, which means that you, uh, your, your tax revenue go down, uh, your uh, uh, purchasing power goes down and so on and so forth, so you actually exacerbate that. That's the so-called debt trap. That is where we, where we are in now. And the financial markets are aware of this, and this is the problem of confidence that the Financial Times journalists, etc., are even talking about. It has become so bad in terms of the financial markets that even the, finan the sort of the financial journalists who are sort of writing to the are sort of saying, "Look, this is becoming really, really catastrophic." And uh, given that you can't devalue, and ultimately, I, I think that uh, the, the analysis that there is going to have to be a devaluation in, in Greece, and therefore all these outstanding toxic debts are going to lose the value. So there has to be some way of. Oh, and if you're going to do this with a VMU, with the current exchange rate values that uh, the Greeks and so on uh, are, are, are on, don't you need some kind of fiscal transfer payment for VMU? We are coming to the situation now where, uh, uh, where some kind of larger fiscal transfer payment is going to be. So you have to move to more, to more of a political union to maintain monetary union. All this large monetary union as we have now is it, not going to be sustainable. Uh, the problem actually can be seen, you don't have to be an economist, it's an arithmetic problem or an accounting problem to some extent. The problem is that uh, the whole recovery process is based on balance of payment surpluses in the peaks. They should pay but becoming more competitive and run, run export surpluses. 
But Germany, Finland, Netherlands, Sweden don't want to give up on their balance of payment surpluses. And it's premised on them continuing to have them. But just arithmetically, if someone is in surplus, someone else has to be in deficit. Uh, uh, the only presumption of that not being the case is that there is a pole out in the world economy that could actually absorb all the surplus pro production coming from Europe. And, and we have had, of course, and of course in the last 10 years, the United States has served that function. But the United States is having its own problem, and the question is whether they can continue to do that. In the last couple of years, we have had a very, very strange conjunction. And uh, that is after the 2009 G20 London Summit, there was a, a kind of recovery from the global deal on how to do that. And in the north, in, in, the, in the core, EU, Euro core, we have seen an export-led recovery in Germany and in European Union small northern states that has been sustained by imports from the emerging markets, the so-called BRICS, uh, because there's been a revaluation of their currencies. Uh, and, uh, but it is very, very clear that this, this room for expansion in the BRICS, given their level of development, is very, very limited. And the consensus is that they are up beyond capacity and going into sort of where they can't really expand anymore. And uh, I think that this is where we are now. And I think that starting to look at the recession starting in core Europe, one can ask ourselves how long are these export-oriented growth strategies that we are pursuing in the north going uh, to, uh, to be sustainable? I think that that is a huge question. And therefore, I think that in a, in a year's time, uh, I think that the Finnish, German, Swedish economies are going to be in, in trouble too. So it's a very, very particular context in which, there's, where, which this country is going to insist on this single-minded austerity dimension. And I think that this is a very, very precarious uh, foundation. So that is a sort of conjunctural context. I think we are in a very, very precarious conjunctural context. And I think that this is very, very dangerous and very, very misinformed. Of course, there is a broader structural context to this, because the whole policy concept of export-led growth, fiscal austerity, and so on and so forth, uh, is, uh, is of a broader vintage that goes back 15 to, to, to 20 years, and particularly to the so-called Lisbon agenda. And the Lisbon agenda was based basically in the idea that the United States is the role model. Uh, we should move towards flexible labor, deep li uh, liquid interregulated securitized financial markets, uh, and that will efficiently allocate capital to high-tech investments, particularly in the South. The Sapir report, uh, which was the intellectual backbone to the Lisbon agenda, made the argument about this. And the situation we're finding ourselves in is that this is shown itself to be a spectacular failure. You know, the, the, the financial crisis is a representation of the misallocation of financial resources of these deep, uh, unregulated financial markets. And that is the mess that we are in Delta now. Greece didn't uh, have a lot of high-tech investments which made it possible for them to catch up within the monetary union. It was, say, it was sort of spent on highly speculative real estate. Uh, and, and that's the problem. So the United States wasn't a role model. What the United States, in fact, was, was the demand side loco locomotive and the clearer of e balances in last instance because of the massive imports that they could, uh, and the balance of payment deficit that they could pursue because of the role of the dollar as a reserve currency and because of the particular configuration of their social economy that made it possible to uh, uh, exp have loans expansion by the middle class underwritten by asset values, values that they had uh, built in there into their mortgages, into the pension savings, and so on and so forth. So basically, we've had an economy, a credit-based economy, underpinned by consumption in the United States, that is based on the extension of debt underwritten by the increased price of asset values. And of course, let's remember the crisis started not in Greece, it started in the subprime markets of the United States. The role model, that's where it started. And basically, the destruction of value, sort of, the whole set of cards uh, uh, fell down. And what that indicated was that as you tried to accumulate capital within this system, you went into ever more risky 
segments of the market, to the subprime, to Eastern Europe, to Greece, and so on and so forth. And in the end, it, uh, it collapsed. I think the basic problem today is that the European Union shows no sign of becoming a kind of a, a sustainable, uh, a self uh, centered continental system of growth in the world economy that had, can do something like what the United States used to do. Everyone is obsessed of, of exporting. Well, that is the, the concept. Uh, and when the, when the United States cannot import to the same extent that they've done, you know, that the BRICs aren't there yet, <coughs> we are in real problem. Now, the problem with the euro could be that paradoxically it has done enough to deplete the capabilities of the United States to be this locomotive. And then, if that is the situation, we are in a very, uh, very, very uh, uh, serious and dangerous straits indeed. And uh, um, I think probably my time is up. Thank you. So, Thank you, Mamma. Okay, we have uh, uh, almost 10 minutes for questions.